It's a beautiful thing, guys. We get to do so many things and be partnered with so many different ministries. Um, such a great testimony of what God is doing. Come on. You know, uh, I want to I want to pray for Judge Kavanaugh real quick, and, and here's why. Um, I realize that um, any time that there is an accusation towards somebody, it's it's a major deal. And, and if there's a victim out there that had stuff happen, and it, that we we don't ever want uh, the enemy to win over on those things, right? I mean, we want those things to be uh, taken care of, brought to light. Um, those are all very good, very redemptive things. Uh, at the same time, we don't want the enemy to use those things uh, to cause what, uh, what he could use with men and women to, to really move forward. I think uh, the accusation was something I don't know a lot about, but I don't think many of us do at this point. I think it was over 30 years ago. Again, I don't want to downplay that. But timing, you know, uh, he, gets, he comes up. It's something that looks like uh, what people would call a long shot. Say long shot. That's what we live in. We live in long shots, right? Meaning God always shows up. It's like, man, that'd be a long shot. I know, but we work for a God who does long shots. That's what he does. That's what he's all about. Uh, but it would appear that if, you know, potentially if they went back and relooked at Roe versus Wade with the new team, that they could possibly just shut the whole thing down, right? And when you think of our prayers and pushing forward and contending and standing in front of places and, and going out onto, into the district and holding signs as people drive by and flip us off or honk their horn excited, right? For years of it, and us really contending for life being in the womb, not when the baby's born. We all know that. And it's, it's amazing that God has continuously been bringing and shedding light on it and shedding light on it. And so I want to pray that, um, that the enemy won't use this to, again, if we connect this with Roe versus Wade, that's a big deal, right? If you start connecting us, well, man, the enemy's coming in trying to shut something down so that what, what he's doing can continue to grow. So let's, let's all just pray into that. God, we just ask Holy Spirit right now. God, we don't know what happened. You do. But God, we do know that you could use this man currently to break off something that has been um, evil and really something that has been destroying our nation and our country for, for generations. So Holy Spirit, we just ask God that you will help. We ask for the victim, God. If this is something that is real and something that she had happened, we ask help her, God. We don't want her to feel like uh, um, she was taken advantage of and it was all okay. We just break off all the heaviness on her, God. We ask, Holy Spirit, that if this is a situation, Lord, you know it, God. You understand her. You understand him. You know all the details. But we ask, God, that whatever happens, that if this is the man that you've called forward, that right now is at a healthy place, God, that maybe he's been redeemed. We don't. But we ask, God, that you'll use him, Lord Jesus, to be a mouth for light, a mouth for uh, life, Lord Jesus, and for truly liberty in a, in a country that is very, very sideways. So, God, we ask you help us, God. We would desperately pray for years that, that Roe versus Wade would be completely shut down, that it'd be closed, that that idea would be canceled, God. And we just speak over that, God. We ask Holy Spirit right now that all the other things you're doing, God, uh, for it, Lord Jesus, that you'll just continue to line those things up. God, we lift up this story, just the movie that's coming out again, shedding more light on truth, God. I ask Holy Spirit for grace on it. I ask for all the finances to be able to market. It goes to the right place and that people will see it, God. We just thank you so much for all you're doing. You're a good God, and we know that prayer works. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. You know, uh, when, when they're talking about being down um, the red light district and being able to give girls tracks and draw them out, it's just, you know, often because we get around so much, you end up uh, being in the middle of nowhere, you know, a decade from now, and somebody mentions tread, and some lady says, oh my gosh, I was at the red district, and here's, I mean, it happens, and we get to hear it. I know a lot of times maybe it doesn't filter into the pulpit. But it's so awesome how many times we constantly hear testimonies and connections. And, oh, you know, it's just, it's amazing. And God has used this house. The prophetic words spoke over this house have come over and over again where, where we'll be a light to all over. And it's happened, and it's downright exciting. Come on. I love it. So, you know, one of the things uh, we're working on currently is our... Uh, That's better. I don't want to break stuff. Um, is really our website, marketing, all the 
you know, the funness of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, we just pulled out a giant whiteboard, literally a huge whiteboard, and just started writing all the different ministries and things we're connected with and, and trying to figure out how we can get if kind of all that on the website <laughs> at some level so you can kind of get connected to different places and all the ministries. And so we filled the whiteboard up and we flipped it over and we started on the backside of the whiteboard. It's just, it's really amazing uh, the stuff that we're, we're involved in. Uh, but I know it's been a strategy of the enemy to, um, to not allow us to get a lot of that down uh, into the, the hands of people, knowing how to get involved. So we're just constantly working on that. But we really are putting it at the forefront of what we're doing. And so same thing. Um, if you guys think about that, just pray for us because uh, it sounds... At times, if you're looking at it from a different perspective, it sounds ridiculous that we can't just throw some stuff on a website. Get, but it's been, it's been overwhelming at times because of, of uh, so many roadblocks. And I know that I can't even explain all that here. But, uh, but we are desperately trying to, to just wrap that up. We're, it's at the forefront of what we're doing right now. And so uh, hopefully here in just a few months, obviously less, because a few months we're going to be in Christmas. Wow. I actually said the word Christmas. Sorry, everybody. Uh, but we just, again, we need some strategies on that. So going forward, if you think about us, pray for us because uh, all the things going on, we need it. Well, I want to talk to you guys about uh, numerous things. I guess I just put end times on here because I know that for Dave, for the prophetic words, uh, Cheryl, for really what this house um, almost has had what I would call a prophetic commission on this house to awaken a church to the reality of the times we're in. I think that's just been kind of the heart and the passion of what this church has been about, about us going from really uh, children to we owe sons to fully mature sons of who Christ, uh, who we are in Christ. It's been something that has, has uh, stirred us. I know here just a few weeks ago, Dave spoke about being awake and not falling asleep and just, again, just trying to stir us. And it's really uh, like it's been almost a mantle that's been put on this house, heavily put on Dave. He spoke with power and passion all over trying to get people to realize who they are and what kind of a time we are in. Would you agree with that? And it's been an awesome thing. It's been an awesome journey. I know that uh, for me, uh, I've been here just long enough that we, we went through a time where um, that in order for God, and I'm telling you this, this, was, this wasn't even something, uh, I don't believe this is something that Dave could even... Uh, not do if he wanted to because it was such a intense uh, passion, this mandate that was on his heart of just pushing us as a church into realizing like where we're at and look around and shaking us to our core, wake up. And it was one of these things that began to poke at every area of things in our lives that would call, we called security. Our financial security and, and what, what are we doing with health care? And I mean, he was, there's this place of us just hearing, what are we doing with health care? Not that it, it went through the same thing. Not that it's bad, right? It was just like, where are we in our hearts? So often we run to the things of the world and not running to God saying, God, help us, help us. And so it was an amazing thing of in my life, him, uh, the Lord using Dave and Cheryl and using the prophetic words over this house and using that really prophetic mantle that's been on this house to begin to really cause me to look in my heart, look in my life, look at my kids and just begin to say, okay, God, what are my real priorities? Um, I, I, I've been here long enough to see men retire with money and I've seen them retire without. Retiring with money is way better right? <laughs> right? That's a, it's a good thing. And we, I, again, I know the Bible talks a lot about us having enough money to give to our children. I'm, but in that, if our hearts are in the wrong place and we're just striving, and that's, that's our whole security is in our financial, we know that's unhealthy, right? So it's that point of, of what this house was doing was beginning to just shake the, the, the idols and shake the thought patterns of what we had and what we called normal and what our culture calls good, if that makes sense. And so I know that for my life, man, I, it, it, it caused me, because of the friends I had around, just, just seeing people go through this, uh, it caused me to really think about my children and begin to think, well, you know what, I need to raise my children differently. And I began to raise them. You know, I hear parents say, if I, I would never say, I'll always be there for you. Nothing bad will ever happen. These, I would never say that. 
Not bad, you know, not because I don't hope that nothing will happen, but I just don't know the reality of where we're headed. And so I always do the opposite. Whatever happens, we have to trust God in it. And that's what I was trying to sustain my children in. I know that it's been, it's been years ago we sat down and I was asking at the time my daughter, I said, sweetheart, something bad happens, the house crashes, and everyone's in it but you, and you're out front. What do you do? She said, I trust the Lord. And I was like, yes. It's like, whoa, that's intense. You actually did that? Yeah, we did it. We began to say, okay, as, as our children are growing up, we want them to come to a place of having a healthy place in their heart that no matter what happens around them, I'm going to trust God. And I think so often we just we live in a culture that is sidetracked on that, so we end up just doing life, and we don't often think about what, what am I raising my children as? And then, then when chaos comes, our kids are like, oh, this is, we got this. I don't know what's going to happen. This is hard. But I, we got to trust God in it because he's a good God. And, and it's hard for us to instill that in us. But if we're not beginning to try to do that as our children are growing, right? And so we, we, because of the mantle on this house and because of me sitting in that chair and hearing the words and beginning to process in my own life, I started shifting in my own life and beginning to say, I'm going to raise my children differently. I want to raise them to be just a rock foundation of trusting God. And in that knowing that whatever happens, we can be open hand. say, God, I trust you. It's not what I thought it was going to look like. We've been, a lot of us have been through those things. And so as people started to come through and we talked about end times, it really helped. I know it helped. It helped us over and over again. And in this process, we felt like there was supposed to be a, well, I think, I, what did I put here? Put uh, called to be a help rather than a hindrance in a state of calamity. You know, one of the things that this house has been called to do is, as a body and as a campus is being a help instead of a hindrance. We've talked about it a lot. We've preached about it. Um, there's been prophetic words about what God's going to do and use us as. And then we begin to say, let's prepare a campus for that. I know that a lot of you have been involved in that. But what we did is we ended up drilling a well on campus. We tried to figure out how can we get water out of the ground uh, in case something happens. So we started looking at generators, and by the time we got to the end of that road, living in California, um, the rules and regulations and the fuel we had to have, and then we had to have special place for the fuel. had to be recycled. We were just like, okay, this isn't, gonna, <laughs> this isn't gonna work unless we have just tons of money. So we thought, okay, what else can we do? So we decided we'll just drill a well, and then we'll have fresh water. We bought the biggest hand pump we could buy, and two guys can pump 100 gallons a minute out of this thing, right? Just we can get some serious water out of the ground. And we figured, okay, there is some disaster things that could happen where we couldn't use it. But for the most part, whatever happens, we got fresh water. Sound like a good idea? All right? So we just thought, okay, that's a great plan. I know years ago we ended up having, uh, we partnered with Red Cross, and a lot of you guys remember that. They came here. We did uh, um, uh, really a campaign. We, we set up people. I know Bill Jen spent massive hours going through and putting different people in charge of different things, and we thought, you know what? If there's calamity, if something happens locally, we're all in. We're going to be prepared. We're going to have people come to our campus, and we are going to just get it on. It was an awesome thing, and we just we kept being at the forefront of that, saying, you know, uh, the prophetic word over this house that we're supposed to be a vanguard. We're supposed to be at the forefront of what God is doing, and we knew we, we wanted to be ready. And so as we started looking into that, the warehouse up at the other end, we always tried to keep about half of it full of beverages and half of it full of useful things, like pallets of almond butter. <laughs> like, it won't go bad, right? <laughs> so we just like, let's just store a couple of those pallets off to the side because you never know. Right, we were just okay. God, we're we're prepared, and I know that we did uh, across the street. Man, we had some, we had drew people in, and and we talked about having backpacks in your car. It was never to try to stir fear in people's hearts. It was trying to bring us to a place of being prepared for whatever God was doing. Because when we look at our our country, we look at our nation, we know that calamity happens because of floods, but it also happens because of people. And we just, we could see it constantly on the horizon. And God's been good to us that we've been able to go to bed every night and wake up and things are, it's, it's an awesome thing and I'm thankful for it. But we didn't want to put our heads in the sand and just say, we're all going to be okay forever. And when somebody talks about it, start plugging our ears, blah, 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 I'm okay tomorrow, right? And so as we began to pursue that, we just, we said, let's do it. Let's start to prepare people and show them what it looks like to learn about survival and be prepared. I'd rather have it and not need it than needed and not have it. 
that was kind of a model. Let's just do it and let's be prepared. And I know in that, it, it did stir fear in people. It stirred some uncertainty in people. It, it shifted people, I think maybe some in, in the negative. But I know for, uh, for us as just a house, there was just too much. It was just that, that place of knowing God is in this and knowing to be prepared. And, and even in that, knowing that we heard just a Joseph storehouse with the warehouse and, again, that place. And I want to read about Joseph in Genesis 41. In here, uh, this is when Joseph comes into Pharaoh. I know most of us know the story. And uh, he is going over the, the dream, the prophetic dream that Pharaoh had. He's just telling him at the very end of it what it meant. And so we'll jump in. Genesis 41 is 28 through 40. It says, it is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten. Say forgotten. And the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered. That's pretty devastating. You have seven years of just awesome, everything's going, and and in just a few years, even the memory of it's gone. It says, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of, all, of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grains under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food shall be had in, severe, in reserves for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? one in whom it is the Spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all of my people are are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne, throne will I be greater than you. Man, it's an awesome story, isn't it? God just uses Joseph in just an amazing thing. You know, Joseph didn't just go through those seven years and store it. The other seven years, he used the, the, really, the wealth of that nation was turned over to Pharaoh because as people would come and say, we're starving, he'd say, I know you are. We have food. You can live on your land. Give us the deeds to it, and then you can stay on it and do it, but it'll be ours. He used it to really capture the wealth of the world for Pharaoh. And we're not trying to capture all the land in Mary's Vale and Yuba City. Well, we, you know... <laughs> We are at that place of trying to say, okay, God, we want to be at the forefront of what you're doing, and we want to be prepared for it. That's our goal. With the, again, that prophetic commission of us awakening a culture, awakening a people to find out and know where, the, where we're at as a country, as a nation in our hearts. You know, during that, that, this time of end times and really pushing people out of their comfort zone and talking through the hard things that we needed to talk through to begin to have us look at our hearts, there was, there was good friends I had that just kind of tapped out. They just said, you know what, I want, okay, let's just talk about, let's talk about everything's going to be okay. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about everything's fine, and with, let's, uh, that's what I want to hear. I don't, I don't want to hear that things might not work, and this country is shaking, and I don't want to hear that. And they just said, I don't, I don't know if I could do this. And because of them not being able to come a place of their heart of shifting it and beginning to let go of some things and begin to come to this healthy place of like, whatever you want to do with it, God, it's not mine anyways. I'm okay with it. So God, tomorrow, if, it's, if I'm here and it's awesome, great. If not, I'm ready. Because there's nothing in me that I'm holding on to. It's just this place of like, whatever you want to do with it. But because they couldn't get there in their hearts, they just... They just said, I can't do this. And I understand that. It was hard. It's been hard. But I'm, st- I'm so thankful for those that stuck it out and said, you know, I'm, I am going to do this. I want to hear this. I want to be prepared. I'm ready. I want to be at the forefront of what God is doing because I'm, I'm called to be that person. We all are. You know, uh, then the floods of, the almost floods of uh, February 2017 happened. I know we remember this. Go ahead and throw that picture out. 
the water coming down. I know that that was on the news, not just here, but all over the place, right? Uh, and it, it obviously was a massive deal. Uh, some Two of my cousins uh, ended up on that because they're uh, some of the top guys of Cal Fire. They ended up at the, at the floods. Go ahead and go to the next one. So we know that. Go ahead and go to the next one. Again, I was trying to, we've seen, everyone's seen tons of pictures of it. We know what it was. But how many people have forgotten about it? on most of the day-to-day, right? Like, being honest, like, at this point, we're going all, we haven't totally forgotten about it, but you're not waking up every day going, I wonder how the dam's going. Hopefully, they're getting her done, right? We're just, like, going off life. And so, you know, in this, when, when that happened, when the flood happened, I was, hmm, again, I believe our, our church, our campus, us people, I believe we're supposed to be a, really a stronghold in calamity. That place, uh, that, that place where people run to. I want them to run to us and go, we don't know what to do. We do. We've got the Spirit of God on us. We're prepared. Come in here. Let's help you. Don't let fear ravage your life, right? Don't let fear ravage your heart. Calm down. It's okay. That's what we're called to as a house. And when, when, when this happened, I realized something. I realized something because I felt like we were pretty prepared as a campus. But when this, when this happened, I realized that there was people that I loved that I was close to that responded very similar to the world. And it, it's, it's kind of, I don't know if scared me is the right word, but it, I was sad because I saw so many of us, people I love that responded like I thought, man, and I realized, God, you, you're, you were talking about the church, our campus being a help instead of the hindrance, but we as people are the ones that are supposed to be a help instead of a hindrance. And I realize, God, if, if you've tried to prepare our hearts as a, as a church, as a body, if you've been trying to draw us out to where when chaos happens, we're the foundation, we're the strong-legged people that just say, it's okay, guys, God's got this, calm down. If, if, if we're not there, we can have the most prepared campus, but if we're not here, we're, we've wasted our time. Like, hey, we're prepared, but we're freaked out as people, so forget about it, Right? And I know that God has been, because of the mandate on this house, really trying to poke at people and say, you know, one of the things that I felt like God was saying is, when I'm trying to prepare you, let me. I believe it was an awakening in our hearts and a testing from the Lord to say, where are, where are we? Um, and again, I, I help people move stuff, move equipment. I'm not against trying to protect our stuff. I'm not against going to the doctor. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm just begin poking at where was our individual hearts in that time. Does that make sense? Are you guys hearing me? Just like where are we as a people? Was I healthy or was something in me out of plumb? Because there was and has been and will always be a message from this pulpit that is constantly pushing us to grow. That's where we're at. It's, what, it's our mandate. It's awakening the church to a reality of who they are. And it's awesome. And I'm glad we're here. And I'm glad I'm part of it. But when God is preparing us, we have to let him. And if you can look back and just kind of reflect on that, I, I want you to just ask yourself, how did you do in it? I think some of us may have thought, man, I felt like I did pretty good. I feel like I trusted the Lord. Some of us might say, you know, I I don't know. I I feel like I I probably didn't handle myself well in my heart. And I think some people, as I was just praying, I feel like some people may have even gone to a place of of now almost grabbing things even more. You know, if there was an idol that they thought they were going to lose, now they're like, man, remember when I almost lost you in 2017? sounds ridiculous, but like there's those times where sometimes like, okay, I didn't lose it. Thank you, God. But now I'm rich. Now it's really precious. You know, the amazing thing is uh, the warehouse now, what I was talking about was where we were. The warehouse now with, uh, with Michael and I know the Burgers and Carol Law, a bunch of us, we, we, just these Cal Fires that we've had, Northern California, we've sent over 100,000 water bottles to the fires. Come on, hear that. To Cal Fire, to cities, 
Guys, we've right now we're currently helping 40 plus families from our local fires that come in. A lot of times, I know the burgers work hard. They contact people. People come in. We give them bedding and we give them new knives and kitchenware stuff that because of what we're getting from Bed Bath and Beyond. And you can't even imagine people that are at a place that they've lost everything. I know some people have been through fires. They've lost everything. They're destitute. The insurance thing's not working out. And then we can come in and help them with just kitchen stuff. It's awesome. Currently, we have, again, uh, in Northern California, up by Redding, there's a, a warehouse that we just sent over 50,000 pounds of products to um, that is, uh, again, I don't know if I want to call it like a satellite warehouse, and I think it's going to be called the Eagle's Nest, and they're already doing a ton of stuff in the city. Because of Good 360 and uh, No Town Left Behind and these, these places that were coming really, some of them under the umbrella, but now people are, because of our connects, are coming under our umbrella, if that makes sense, and we're becoming that channel of products in times of calamity. And we're more prepared now. If something happens locally because of the connects we have, because what Michael's done, because of what we've done, we're, we're ready. Man, we can, before we thought, man, if we could have half of a warehouse full of water, now if we just have stuff shipped here because of the contacts we have. It's awesome. Hmm. You know, just even what's happening with Hurricane Florence, um, with, again, No Town Left, all these other ones we're partnering with, they're sending airboats and the helicopter. They've been able to start getting stuff in because the waters, they're doing other ways to get products in. And because of that, we're, we're a part of all that. We're just sitting here, right? <laughs> I always say this. It's amazing. If, I'm, if we're off doing something at work and you're, you're during your day, but in reality, because of what you've been able to, uh, to give to this house, because of your prayers, you're doing stuff all over the place, and I love that. But I feel like we're, we're being called to a place of, of a saying, okay, our campus is more prepared than ever, but are we? Are you? I think we need to ask ourselves, am I ready? Because it's a big deal. Because that's what God is calling us to. God is calling us to be prepared so that in a time of calamity, we can be a help instead of a hindrance. If I'm not ready, I'm a hindrance. I'm a hindrance because I'm not a, a, sta I'm not a stable p person for people to come to. I'm just, a, 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 my voice isn't in a place that's healthy. I'm seeding fear on people. I'm fearing myself, fearing my kids, right? If I'm not there, hmm. I, again, I deleted this slide, but I'm going to just read through this really quick. It says, uh, there was a man in 1519. He had a fleet of 500 soldiers, 100 settlers, and 16 horses on 11 ships. They were going to take the world's richest treasure of gold, silver, artifacts, and jewels. The treasure had been held by the Aztec Empire for over 600 years. Everyone knew about the treasure because army after army had tried to take it, but no one had been able to. This guy's name was Hernando Cortez. He knew that time after time people had gathered armies, so he had to gather an army whose level of commitment was beyond that of what ordinary people considered commitment. I'm sure that in, in the process of him trying to galvanize an army, he talked about them being able to get rich and what it would be like and how they'd be able to bring their own boats back and their kids would be rich, right? He probably stirred people to say, we're going to go get this. Hmm. says, I'm sure his speech stirred the men, but they didn't just get there and go in and run in and try to grab the treasure like everybody else. They waited on the beach. It says that he brought all the men together, and I'm sure they thought he was going to give them a big spiel about, again, the monies and how awesome it was going to be and what they could do with it, but he just gave them three simple words. He said, burn the ships. I'm sorry, what did he say? Did I? <laughs> what? He said, burn the ships. He said, if we're going home, we're going to go home in their ships. He knew if there was no turning back, the fight in their heart, they're all in. It was either we win or we die. Guess what? They fought hard. <laughs> right? They won. They took the treasure. They took over the Aztec. And I'll tell you what, guys, one of the things in life that I think we so often do is we have the, the boat in our lives. We have something, we have a security, we have something that we just kind of leave there. 
And we just say, okay, I'm going to do this, but just in case, I'll be a little divided. You know, if, if 100 of those men or 50 of those men or 20 of those men at the end thought, you know, we can, we can make the boats, guys. Let's head back. We can get there. We can get, we can get the sails up. I think we can get out of here. If that would have been in their hearts, they wouldn't have been 100% committed. What in our lives, what area of our lives, guys, do we have some boats that need to be burned? And it might be, it might be stuff. It might be addictions. It might be there's a million things in our hearts. But what is it in your life that is allowing you to not be 100% committed in an area? I think most of us, the Holy Spirit right now, will just say, here it is. I want to read, uh, this is Paul in Acts. Just again, uh, there's so many amazing stories in Paul, but I just, Acts 21, 10 through 14. We're going to just jump in. Uh, this is before Paul obviously uh, had been arrested. It was before he got on a, a ship and was shipwrecked. It was before he was bit by a serpent. It was before all the massive adventures he had had. It was the very beginning of them. And it says, in 10 it says, and as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Abagus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping? And breaking my heart, for I am ready not to only be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, say not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. <laughs> Guys, I think that, again, in our own lives, if we look at that passage, say, okay, if a prophet takes my belt away, binds his heart, it says, hey, here's what's going to happen to you. It's like, oh, I must, must not supposed to be to go, right? <laughs> Thanks for the warning. I'm probably supposed to stay home after that one, <laughs> right? I mean, hey, that's a great warning. Praise God, you warned me. Now I'm like, and if all of our friends are like, no, man, that's not, you can't go. You're right. I'm not going to go. That'd be crazy. <laughs> going to be bound. That was the very, very beginning. If his heart hadn't have been there, he'd have never done the amazing journeys that he got to do. I wrote again, when I'm preparing you, let me prepare you. I just put in my notes, stop listening to the voice of the people, to the voice of the enemy, and to, to our flesh. You know, uh, because of what we've done all over the world, um, I've ended up, uh, I've spent a lot of time smuggling money. I always say I'm smuggling Bibles. When you say you're smuggling Bibles, people are like, cool. When you say you're smuggling bum money, they're like, what? <laughs> What's going on? It's like, eh, I'm smuggling Bibles, just in different form. But I've smuggled money all over the place. It's been fairly dangerous at times. I know that I've, I've, I have got caught once in Dubai, and they just looked at me like I was a moron for carrying so much cash and let me go, <laughs> which is totally awesome. Uh, but there's been a few times where uh, it's... It's been close. I know we were in India one time, and um, I was by myself, and they ended up um, holding me back. And as I was trying to get through some different places, they, they didn't let me. I ended up having to stay there over the night, and I just was texting back, guys, pray. I don't know what's going on, but they've, they, they've detained me, and it's not looking good. And at the time, I had uh, most of what we needed to try to wrap up what we were doing in northern India. And, uh, and uh, there was a gentleman there that when uh, he saw me, he remembered me and Dave from the, the time before. And he was like, hey, he remembered my name. And he ended up, man, it's crazy. Now, if I ever go through there, it's like my wife's smiling and laughing. He, he runs down the thing and, like, almost tackles me to the ground. Like, like we've been best friends forever. Like, God did something in this guy's heart. Now I can smuggle anything I want. <laughs> no, hey, I'm joking. I'm just, no. But literally, like, it went from the most dangerous place, right, where, man, if we get caught here, it's, they're going to not just take it, but it's going to look bad, to where now literally... We go in, and we don't walk down the normal aisles. He opens, the, like, the metal doors, and we go the back way. 
Like, seriously. I know. Come on. Let's hear it for God. He just knows that something, in God did something that is just, uh, it's supernatural. Like, he partnered me and his heart to where it's like, he's, I'm his brother, and it's, it's weird. <laughs> but it's the only thing the Lord could do. You know, he saw, he saw me, he grabbed, he, he went up. It was funny because one of the airline places, they were, even with me standing there, there was these guys that they were, still, they were mad and they were saying, we're not going to do this because of this. And he pulled his phone out and was like, do you want me to call this person? And they're like, nope, go ahead. <laughs> Come on, how awesome is that? Come on, it is totally the Lord. And it's, again, it's something that we've been called to as a house. Hmm. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. You know, uh, Mark Verkler was just here. Uh, he did a conference this last weekend, and one of the things he was sharing, one of the stories he was talking about is feeling like he had to trust God and in stepping out into the ministry he currently has. And he was talking about how difficult it was he had a job, he's making money, he just kept thinking. <clears throat> there was a thing his mom had spoke over him. She said, you need to go to college and you need to get this stuff set up so when ministry doesn't work out, you have something to fall back on. And so what happened in his heart, he just kept thinking, ministry's not going to work out, I've got to have something to fall back on. It was his boat in his heart of like, I, I, I've got to be prepared to. So in that, it caused his heart to feel like I'll never be able to really do full-time ministry because it's just not going to work out. And so the Lord was pushing him hard, just like one of those times where God's just like, no, I want you to do this, I want you to do this. And so he said he had a great job and things were good, and these guys came in and they fired him. So it was one of the worst things. And he was totally confused because of how things were running and how smooth things were going. All of a sudden, he's fired. He thought this was going to be like where he retired from. And he said he knew it was the Lord, and he said, I knew I was supposed to at that time begin to do what he's currently doing. Right? He knew in his heart that was the, the beginning of God, you know, kicking him out of the nest. And instead, he got another job. Like right there, he had another job offer, so he felt like, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm, it's just that fear blaze thing, right? Like I, I, got, I got security over here. So he said they hired him, and he was supposed to be going there. He went in, sat down, and they said for two hours, he said it was the worst experience ever had. He said for two hours, they scolded him about his theology, <laughs> he said it was so awesome. He said it was one of those times where the Lord was saying, I, I'm not going to let you do this. If you're going to try to do this, I'm going to put you around people that aren't going to partner with you. And he said that was the, that's what it took for him to have something in his heart, say, okay, God, I'll, I'm, I'm in. You know, I, I was just, again, I was looking at just Jonah because I think so often when I read the passage of Jonah, I just think, man, I don't, I don't think I would do that. It seems like such a ridiculous saying, God says do this, and I think I'm all in. But I don't know if that's a reality. You know, I think that, actually, I just want to read that first passage. It's uh, Jonah 1, 1 through 3. It says, the Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amatia. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went to the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Everyone say, get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Now, we know in that it didn't work out for him. But the amazing part of that story is that God's like, hey, I want you to do this. And he instantly is like, not a player, God. I'm out. God ended up burning his, his boat down for him, right? right? They threw him out of the boat. He got, we know the story. And I love that there's times where God will go ahead and do that for us. He'll burn our own boat, say, you know what, son, I love you enough that I'm still going to use you. I love that there's grace for that. But, guys, I want to be mature enough to not respond that way. I want to be at a place in my heart where I'm not responding out of a, I don't want to do that because of my own idea of what it's going to look like because of fear, because of the prophetic words that have been spoken over my life that I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about. You know, there's a story about, about two women that I love. I think it's one that we don't hear much. It's in Exodus 1. I think it gets overlooked a lot. And it's Exodus 1, 8 through 21. It says, Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. 
Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if, we, if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put the slave's master over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Remesis as a store city for Pharaoh. But the more they were opposed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. Everyone say ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. All in their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. I think I just skipped. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sephra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbearing on the delivery stool, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God. Say, feared God? And did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Hmm. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because of the midwives, because the midwives feared God, say feared God, he gave them families of their own. You know, guys, Cortez was chasing after gold and silver and just the things of this world. How much greater are the things he's called us to? If we're supposed to be a help instead of a hindrance, how are we doing at that in our own lives? You know, we, we can read so many amazing stories, and we can even hear stories about what God has used us for, and men and women who've been willing to step out even when they've had the prophetic word that they might be bound because they've burnt, they've burnt the boats and said, I'm all in. Guys, what area of our lives do we need to burn the boats? What areas of your life, because of the calamity that happened in February of 2017, do you still say, you know what, how, how, have, I, how have I done since then? How did I respond then? Is my heart better? Am I closer? Am I more prepared? Say more prepared. Am I more prepared than I was then? You know, I know that's been years that people uh, that we've talked to in different ministries, some, some uh, people who know who they were, uh, that said, well, I can't believe you guys live in California. It's supposed to, like, break off. And I was, you're supposed to be like, we're supposed to have beachfront property, right? That's where we're at. It's supposed to break off, and I would never live there. That's crazy. And, uh, and I know that for us right now, it's like, no, oh, that'll never happen, right? <laughs> or well, maybe that won't ever happen. Well, but if, all of a sudden, if earthquakes start happening and the news says we might break off, we're going to talk about calamity, right? Or do we just say, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust God. I'm, I'm here because I know that I am. We are supposed to be the voice for a city. We're here because we know that God has chosen us to be the, the strong foundation, the stronghold for our city. That's why we're here. And we know that. And not an earthquake or a potential flood, nothing's going to take us from that because it's what we're called to do. And it's not just what we're called to do, it's what we're called to do. So, again, I want us to really say, God, what what in my life, is there, is there a boat that I'm, I've got behind me that I know I can retreat to? Is there something that I'm constantly, it's just pulling at me? What is holding me back from being 100% from when I hear the word of the Lord and I think I'm all in, God, no matter what it looks like? Not fear-based, not hesitant. Guys, I desperately want this place to be, I, I want us to be so healthy and so ready for whatever God brings. I know we all do. I want us to be so foundational and so prepared in our hearts and in what we have going on that, that we aren't wavering. You know, uh, I was getting ready to go on a trip. It was one that I got very, very sick on, uh, almost died. Actually, almost became a retarded. I know you guys know that. Mentally challenged. Can't say that. Um, it's actually not even that. It's, anyways, 
I had massive brain damage. God supernaturally healed me. But I will say this, guys. Before I went on that trip, I remember feeling like I don't know what's going on in my spirit. And I remember looking at my son and saying, no matter what happens, trust the Lord. That was, my, that was kind of my thing. Like, I want to instill in my kids. Like, no matter what happens, we have to trust God. If I can get my kids, if I can get my heart there, then, then it's, it's almost easy. Even in the hard times, it's like, okay, God, I don't understand, but, but the, there's no other path. And then in that, and in the hardness of it, and in it, all of a sudden we look back and we can see where God showed up. It's when he shows us miracles. It's when he stirs our faith. You know, there's been some men and women in this house that have gone through some hard stuff. And I'm looking at them going, man, God has made them women of faith and men of faith. He stirred them in a foundation that when they hear other things people are going through, they're like, that would be easy. Have you ever felt that way? Like, oh, man, if they only knew... Whoa. But it's, it's like, okay, but what I want to do is I just, I want to be in a place, guys, as a, as a body at the forefront of what God has for us. Let's stand up. I want to pray for us. I want to pray for myself. So, again, Holy Spirit, God, challenge us. God, I'm thankful that the mandate on this house is to awaken a people to see the times we're in, to see who we are called for, to be contenders for a city, for a nation, and for a world, God, that you haven't just brought us here to do same old, same old, but you've pushed us into this place for contending, for praying, for seeing things like Roe versus Wade overthrown, for doing the things that we're called to do, not just the mealy mouth, simple stuff, but the hard stuff, God. And we are saying, choose us, pick us, and in that, you've said, I've chosen you to be a vanguard church, to be at the very front of what I'm doing, God. And we say amen to that. And in that, God, I say, shift us out of where we're at into another place. Don't allow us that, to, to stand in the same place. Don't allow us to sleep through what you're trying to do. But instead, God, is help us to be at the forefront of that in our lives. And not just as we're looking around and saying, man, I'm glad they're doing that. Help us to be that. And God, if there is something in our hearts that you want to to burn, that we are saying, I, I just keep coming back to you. God, give us the grace to light the match. And Holy Spirit, right now, just speak into some of our lives. That, that, well, those of us in here that this may even be a hard word. Like, I know there's that. I don't know how to get rid of it. There's been so many times in our lives, God, I, I know in my life where I haven't known how to, how to get out of that. I haven't known how to burn it. But we first have to open our hands and say, God, just do what you want with it. Holy Spirit, help us to be moms and dad who don't just raise children, but raise God-fearing children. Children that we can say, trust God. When things happen, trust God. God, I thank you for the men and women in this house. I thank you for the men and women that have pushed me forward and poked at my heart and said, you can do better, you can do this. I thank you for that, God. But call us all, God, to that place in our hearts. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Awesome. Love you guys. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see this, see this next week. Oh, also, the tent revivals. I'm going to just give a quick testimony. Um, the Chris Madsen, this week, I think it was Thursday, they, they came in, stole everything out of his house. He's one of the pastors. I know there's a whole lot of churches helping. He's one of the, they just took it all. And that was about 2 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, I got a phone call that they got it all back. Come on. How awesome is that? A couple hours. But it's a great testimony, but we'd love to see you out there. It's a great time. So have a great week. We love you guys.